Good evening and welcome back to uh, another one of our Q&As for our annual plan. So thank you very much to everyone who might be joining um, live or watching this uh, later on. Uh, with me tonight, I've got our roading manager, Kushla Tapper. Um, Kush is going to be helping us out, uh, probably actually uh, carrying the heavy load, uh, around any questions on roading. So importantly, we are looking at um, uh, asking or consulting on a number of questions on roading as, as part of our annual plan. We have some challenges around affordability, of course, and um, we also have a, some issues around our funding partner, NZTA or Waka Kotahi. Um, those, those challenges that they have is that their ability to fund only to a certain level. So for every dollar that we normally spend on roading, 57 cents, I think it is, comes from Waka Kotahi, and the other 43 cents is rate payer money. When uh, they don't have, when they use up their budget, there's no more. So when we want to do extra work uh, over and above what might be approved, um, we basically have to pay the full dollar. So we don't get as much value for, for the money. So the question we're going to be asking this year is, what, what, what do you want us to be doing around the rates for roading. We can keep paying the same amount we've paid in the past, and basically we'll be going backwards in the road quality, which I don't think too many people want that. Um, we can pay a bit more and keep it where it is, or we can pay a bit more than that and actually try and get some improvements. So um, we haven't got actual numbers on what that might look like at the moment, but that's the general theory and the, um, the general questions that we'll be asking as part of the consultation. So anyway, we'll um, get into uh, some of the more, more of the detail around roading. It is uh, very important to the Waitaki district, of course. Uh, we've got um, across our 7,000 square kilometres, we've got around about 1,800 kilometres of roads. Around about a third of those are sealed roads and uh, two thirds are gravel roads. Um, hopefully Kushla can tell us a wee bit about the actual dollars that are spent on the roads at the moment. Um, and obviously there's there's other aspects of roading like footpaths and street lighting and things like that, which come into it. So what can you tell us about that, Kushla? I can tell you that the maintenance contract for general roads, which does not include the resurfacing or the footpath reconstruction or any road reconstruction, which is the rehabs, um, or any new stuff, so all bridges, is around about $5.2 million a year at the moment. And the comments earlier about funding from Wakakatahi, so um, you're very correct that we've got 57% of our three-year plan agreed um, at, as external taxpayer funded by Wakakatahi and ZTA. And that, so currently we've put in our bid for the next three-year bucket and those funding priorities are set nationally partly by the GPS, the Government Policy Statement, and the uh, current government has put in a, a new draft GPS, which has changed quite a lot of the categories. So we're having to rejiggle a little bit about what we're asking for and what sort of work categories, and particularly with the pothole prevention fund. So it's changing the ring fencing about what gets done in what different way. And for example, the bridge stuff has been moved work categories, which we're just asking a few questions there for impact mm. on how Wakakatahi get to make the decisions via the announcements that will come from the Ministry of Transport after the GPS is finalised. Yeah, and I guess that's the difficult thing is that um, everyone, I, I guess, has a, an image of, you know, there's one pot of money and, the, you know, whatever needs to be done comes out of that, but actually you've got to put forward your programme of work for the year and it's div divvied into those different categories and yeah. that's pretty much where you've got to spend the money um, accordingly. And... Uh, yeah, you know, one of the challenges I think around the GPS in the past is that there's been requirements that the government says that if you want our money, we need you to do these things. And some of those things aren't things that we've necessarily agreed with, but we've um, felt the need to do that. But, um, you know, one of the challenges is taking back a little bit of control and making sure that we're spending money on the things that are important to our ratepayers. And, um, you know, that, that means possibly... Uh, not getting subsidy 
for some things if we choose not to go with some of those national requirements. Yeah, or potentially getting an average of less. So say we ask for $20 million, I'm just going to make up some numbers, um, over three years and nationally uh, the, the whole government bucket is currently oversubscribed by $1 billion and I didn't make that number up, um, out of a budget of about nine um, for, for the whole country, uh, we're all asking for 10. So there's going to be some cuts. So say we were asking for 20 and we get approved 17 million over the next three years, then we get the 57% still applies, but only to the value that was agreed upon. So if we still want to spend 20, we 100% fund the 3 million difference, which then brings our average um, subsidy lower. So that, those are the kind of discussions that we wanted to have with our communities and going, well, if we know that we're likely to be faced with a wonderful subsidy that's still less than what we'd like, <laughs> because as a nation we, we can't afford what we'd like, um, what are the tough choices that we need to make and how much mm. do we want to fund locally and what kind of things would we look at changing to make it stay cost the same? Mm. Yeah, so, um, yeah, some some interesting decisions we've got to make along the way. Um, I mentioned before there's some things that get funded out of the roading, um, such as footpaths and so on. So the policy around footpaths, um, just to clarify that, is that if we've got a community that wants a new footpath put in, that um, basically that gets paid out of the amenity rates for that, um, that town or village or whatever area it is. So if they've been paying an amenity rate, that's accumulates over time and if they've got enough in there we can get on with that um, new footpath for example um, that could be that could include widening existing footpaths or um, you know that type of new work so when it comes time to main um, for maintenance on that footpath that comes out of the roading budget overall doesn't it over the last three years it has right. and we were really lucky that um yeah, in the 21 to 24 National Land Transport Plan, footpaths became a subsidised activity, whereas previously they had to be 100% funded by local rates. That was the formation and maintenance of. So um, recently we've been able to utilise a subsidy for the maintenance of all existing footpaths, which is really cool. And then there was a separate uh, work category for walking and cycling improvements as part of mode shift and trying to enable communities to have equal access. And so, that, yeah, we made good use of that. There were some projects that we had put in our annual plan and long-term plan as expecting them to be 100% funded by a local rate that we were then later on allowed to claim subsidy for, which was pretty cool, like the Ardgown cycle where we ended up being able to get 57% subsidy on that when that was not expected. So that's pretty cool. No, I don't think I realised that one. So that's a good win. Um, and, yeah, the, the, I guess some of the projects we have invested in in the past and people haven't really seen the value in some of them have been around some of the safety works. And, um, uh, yeah, I, I think the generally referred to as, um, you know, putting bits of concrete on roads. Um, and some of them, I think, do make sense to the community. They can see the benefit of it, and others it just doesn't seem to make sense. But, um, you know, that's, that's part of that GPS. It's part of the requirement or is around, you know, expe expectations of us and how we spend our money. Um, but one of the things we are doing is looking at how we, respond to some of those requirements and um, whether we actually say, well, we'll forego the NZTA subsidy and we'll actually just use our money for the fixing those potholes or whatever it might be that we want to on our local roads. And, yeah, that it's it, the money doesn't go as far, but it, it gets spent on the things we want to. And I think that's um, the challenge that we are looking to, to meet. <laughs> we'll see how that one goes. Um, over the year, over this coming year, we've got a number of projects, a couple of projects that are in the uh, annual plan. Um, I don't expect you've remembered or memorised all of them, but um, one, one of the obvious ones is the uh, continuation of the work on the Kakanui Bridge. So that's a, 
a multi-year project. Um, I think some of the funding was in this it is in this current year, and there's a bit of work that's been carried out on that. Um, there's uh, around about three, but over three million, I think, in the next year. So that's to get construction underway. And yeah, so at the moment it. we've got a budget for this current financial year for the design and investigation. So the investigations are all complete. We've got uh, the tender for the design has gone out, and there's been a few different options uh, lightly scoped out, and there'll be a community workshop. Uh, public available workshop to discuss those options in the near future. And then there's also $3 million a year for the next three years um, proposed for the total value of the project. And that's one of the things that has been affected by the draft GPS where that work category has changed and it's now been put into a category that requires a business case for everything over $2 million. So that's what we're waiting for on the feedback because we'd already had the project confirmed. Right. And now we're going, well, it doesn't meet the new criteria. So let's find out what impact that has on us and what we need to do. Right. Yeah. Okay. We will wait and see. Um, there's there's been some queries around the, um, the, the fact that we were recommending a replacement bridge be single lane and uh, you know, it's probably helpful um, as much as we'll cover that off in much more detail in the workshop, mm -hmm. public public workshop with there. Um, it'd be good to perhaps just detail, you know, the types mm -hmm. of options we go through that then becomes a recommendation through to council. So obviously looking at the materials um, as, as part of it, what a bridge will be built of, um, its location, obviously there's been work on that, scoping that. Um, and, you know, we, we've currently got a, a very old 140-year-old bridge, is it 120-year-old? Very old. Um, very cool old bridge that's very... actually functioning really, really well for its age, yeah, and isn't yeah. showing um, fast deterioration. No, really well, cool it was, it was um, they said when it was put in, it was, this will last 100 years, and it has done more than that, so we're, we're pretty good. But the problem now is that um, the structural integrity of it is that when we have flooding events and you get too much timber and stuff piled up against the um, the, the piles, um, then it basically gets closed down and, and um, traffic can't use it. A new bridge... Will yeah, you know, I think one of the design problems with the current bridge is it's 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 a, an arched bridge, um, and so it's very difficult when you're going from one end to see if there's something actually starting already on the bridge at the other end, and um, the expectation is the new bridge won't be that; it'll be much much more level, flat almost. Yeah, it'd be far better what we call vertical alignment, right? In terms of being able to see what's coming out without without a hump. Yeah, and and I think that'll help. Um, it's being designed with uh, separate walking, walking and cycling track or path. There will be an an area separate to the vehicle carriageway for people to safely walk along. Yeah, 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 yeah. but not a like, but not like a clip on no, type. No, yeah, yeah, part of the single structure. Yeah, and. Um, and I think the important thing is, you know, when, when you're considering single versus double lane, um, traffic count comes into it, doesn't it? Was was there forecast done on what the traffic might look like in 20, 30, 40 years? You, you can do a bit of crystal ball gazing, uh, but in terms of, yeah, the lifespan of a bridge, it, it's, we're expecting them to last at least 100 years. And terms of other options for even if the traffic was to quadruple, it would still be significantly less than the current level of traffic on State Highway 1 over um, the Conway River in Haranui, and, and that's a single lane, and it's longer, and it has passing bays, and that's not being replaced by the two-lane bridge. So yeah, the national priorities are around keeping um, most one lane bridges as they are, mm -hmm. where they're a safe uh, place to for vehicles to stack and wait. And even if the vehicle count started to increase to there being an issue with a natural priority give way, putting in signals and control is another way of really quite affordably managing that issue. Right. Well, I think we've got a few questions we need to answer, so we probably should get on to those, and we've got uh, Mandy helping us out with those. So 
She's uh, seeing what's coming through. There's been a number of questions previous to this session, and um, we'll respond to those along the way as well. But uh, Mandy, what have, what have you got for us? Yeah, thanks so much, Mercutio. Just on the topic that you're talking about right away with the uh, Corral Bridge, someone's made a comment and just said, I hope you have considered 50 tonne vehicles when redesigning this bridge. Have you got any sort of response to that? Sort of? Yes. <laughs> and it'll be able to take 50 tonne. So yeah, heavy. So be, yeah, be tonne. Yeah. Or at least be able to take class full class one, which I currently can't. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think that was an important part of it to you know cut travel times and you know journey distances and things like that to make it make sure it did comply with that. So yeah, very important. The ideal minimum expectation is that should State Highway One be closed and that route need to be used as a bypass, that that standard traffic could pass over it where it currently cannot. Okay. Thank Thanks. You. So we've got another question here. What quality controls are put in place to check roading projects? Um, got a wee bit of a response here from Roger, I think. Yeah. So uh, I'll hand that to you. Oh, you. Yeah, oh you, you've got it there. Yeah. I'll leave it to you. Yeah, so depending on the nature of the project, uh, we typically have a lot of uh, site meetings and our roading team staff attend quite a few site inspections. Plus, um, with the way modern technology works, there's an awful lot of uh, document keeping within an electronic system. So there are lots of evidence photographs um, collected and stored and shared in real time. And yeah, you know, we can even do video calls and see what is actually being dug up and, and found as we go through. So we don't necessarily have to be on site. I mean, hopefully we'll see fewer people on site, but actually more eyes on the job. Yeah. That's good. And, and um, one of the things we put in place uh, from the governance team side of things is that we've got the roading subcommittee, which... Um, helps to give the some of our rural councillors in particular um, a bit of an oversight for or an ability to feed in what they're seeing out in the in the countryside with um, various works and so forth so I think that's part of the process that we've set up as well um, Mandy, yeah. Thanks for yeah, so I think this relates to the earlier conversation uh, regarding you know cost of roading increasing and it's just been asked the question here, why not do something that's very successful over in Australia, and that being introducing road user tolls? Um, yes, it, it pretty much is an, a central government decision to do that. And, and there are some, I think there are some toll roads now or being introduced in the, toward the top of the North Island. I think there's some, um, certainly talk about that as a way of um, getting some funding. Generally, um, they are put on uh, modern motorways, um, express, expressways and so forth, and uh, they work best when the, there is an alternate route that people can take. Uh, it might take them longer and so forth, but it means they don't have to pay. But um, as far as it goes here, if they were being... We, we, the council doesn't have the ability itself to put tolls on roads. It's really central government that does have that power. So under the Local Government Act and the Land Transport Act, public roads are public access and they're not tolled. And the few situations where there are tolls within New Zealand is when there's been a private-public partnership and that has been specified before the road <laughs> or bridge or whatever was constructed and that that was um, stated as being a way of collecting the revenue to finance the project. And, and that's quite a different setup in Australia to New Zealand. Yeah. There was a, the ability for local councils to have a regional fuel tax, which is more of a road user charge as opposed to a toll. Um, but that has also been removed with the current GPS. Okay. Oh, sorry, the current draft GPS. Draft GPS, yeah. The yeah, submission closed today on that. We did get a submission into Correct. it, so yes. Mandy. So I've got another question here. Um, repairs on the hill 
on 7th Street seem to be very patchy when done instead of a proper resurface. Are there proper repairs planned for this? And they have also made a further comment that they understand that this being 7th Street is probably NZTA as it's State Highway 1, but it is still an issue and just wondering if you know anything about that. Yeah, well, yeah, I mean, fundamentally, yes, it is NZTA, but it'd be good to talk about our relationship with NZTA and yeah. what influence we have or um, or don't have. Yeah. I'll leave it to you. To... Yes, yeah, so we have uh, regular liaison meetings with the State Highway Maintenance Group, um, so that's not the decision makers, but the, the implementers, and that we most recently had one about two weeks ago, and Seven Street was discussed at that particular one as well as previous ones. Um, whenever we receive a customer request or a snap send solve about it that comes to us, we pass it on to State Highway Network straight away, and they're definitely aware of it. In terms of why would you go and do a patch repair rather than do the whole thing, um, because the whole thing requires a huge amount of money, time, planning, um, closures, advertising, and in terms of delivering value for money, same as what we do with our local roads, when we've got... 10% of an area that needs to be fixed, we'll only go and fix 10% of it. We're not going to go and dig up the whole thing or make it all look pretty. It's not about cosmetics. It's about functionality, and that's how we deliver value for money. Yeah, I think um, just on that, you know, we do see um, occasionally potholes that get patched, and, you know, within 24 hours, 48 hours, they, you know, pretty much it's all blown out again, Um not not the least part because there's probably water involved and and uh, also heavy traffic that's going over it. But um, yeah, it, it does seem a waste at times to just keep patching. And you know what what's the what are the things that need to align for you to actually go in and say right, we're going to cut this bit of road out and fix it properly. So a bit of pothole forms, typically um, you go out and I'll, I'll use a state highway example because it's one that we can most regularly see. Uh, we've got a lot of traffic going over it in quick succession and if there's any moisture in the air at the time or if we've got a light shower of rain, um, even a little bit of water sitting on the surface, by the time a few trucks have gone over it and the, the pressure from the tyres actually forces the water right through um, can go from being something that's the size of a, a golf ball to the size of a, a tennis ball to a basketball really, really quickly. And so the immediate response, which people can do, is go and fill, which is only a, a very, very temporary measure, but it makes it safe in that short term. To be able to actually fix it, you usually need to cut an area, if it's in Ashfield, then you've got to get a, a concrete saw and saw cut it out. Then you've got to dig down to the point where you actually find dry material, which could be anything from 50 to 250 mils deep. Then place new material in layers and compact it because otherwise it's going to sink. Um, in terms of doing that on any open road, you would need to close at least that lane or wider, and if the road isn't wide enough to have still two lanes of traffic passing around you, then you've got to have detours set up. Um, that so A lot of the time you need agreement from the client that they'll pay for it. <laughs> we're, we're in that same boat all the time as well, going, well, is it sensible to close the road to go and fix two square metres over there, whereas if we patch it and it lasts for three weeks, but we organise to come and do five other things, or we know that it's going to be a rehab site next year, then just patching it is actually far more affordable than properly fixing it that first time. A lot of people think, I don't need to do it right, do it once, and, and that keep, saves us lots of money, but it, it doesn't. It really doesn't. Mm. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's, it is challenging, and it's not getting any easier with the, you know, the, the high cost of traffic management. It's just... Um, become such a, a very high part of the the expense for a job, um, particularly if it's if you happen to do whatever you, you know what you're mentioning. There's quite a cost to um, just repairing that small bit that's that's yeah, in traffic management. And you're lining up a lot of different type of machinery and and very small thing to fix. Like you, you, to take a digger to go and dig, you're not going to dig through. Um, Ashfelt with a shovel, like you need a digger. Mm. 
but then you've got to get it there and you've got to find a safe place to park it and offload it. And, you know, and, and you're thinking, well, I'm only going to get paid for you know, $30 worth. <laughs> it's cost me $80 just to load it up and get it there. Um, yeah, so we're trying, trying to be sensible about how what we ask people to do and keeping people safe when they're on the road and not exposing them to traffic. And customer expectations really changed in terms of if you're going to close off a lane, people get really mad um, being delayed for one to two minutes and having to go on a detour. And I didn't know such and such a road was going to be closed. And if we went out and fixed everything as soon as it turned up, one, the rates would probably be about 600 times higher than they currently are, um, and there'd be way more cones everywhere. You'd never get anywhere. I think a lot of people would. Find it hard to believe there could be more cones. <laughs> anyway, that's the way it is. All right, Mandy, uh, next one. Thanks for that, Kushla. Um, one of the you mentioned before about the SNAP send and solve system, and, and one of the questions that we received earlier on um, was, could you please explain the operation of the SNAP send solve system, and in particular how a contributor is advised or can check that a reported issue has been resolved? Just so I guess to introduce it, Snaps and Solve, if people aren't aware of it, it's an app you can put on your phone um, and when you see something, if you're out and about, you can take a photo of it um, or later on you can report it. Um, but yeah, basically allows you to report it straight away if you want with a photo included if you want um, and saying what the problem is. And it, it covers a range of different things and it's not only our council that uses it, it it'll pick up whatever area you're in and ask uh, what the um, what the issue is and then it'll point to you to either, I think, the Otago Regional Council, for example, or the Waitaki District Council. Um, so it, it's saying that this is an issue for, for that entity. Um, but, yeah, it means that that, uh, re that report goes straight into, um, in, in our case, it goes straight into our council, um, does it also go to the contractor at that time? No. So we have to, we then action it. Yeah. So it so comes to our service email yeah. for customer service and that is then handled as, uh, it's then loaded into our own internal system. So Snap Send Solve is a free app that's available nationwide. You can load it on your phone once and you can use it wherever you go within the country. So if you're on holiday and you notice something and you think, that's not right, that toilet's locked and my child is in there and they can't get out. I've got them out, but I should still let the council know that the lock's broken. Um, this came up at a cricket right. practice <laughs> recently. And I said, why have you used Snap Send Solve to report it? And showed them how to do it. And so it picks up uh, the, as long as you've got the location uh permissions enabled on your phone it will work out where you are when you take the photograph it'll work out what local authority uh, your issue re relates to depending on what you've said your issue is so you can say anything from roaming dogs to potholes to street lights out to toilets not flushing all sorts of things we really recommend you use it um, then so it's the each local authority that's registered with it provides different email addresses for the different classifications. So if you put in something about roading on our network, then it'll come to the service. We then load it in our own internal customer request management system, and then we follow our standard processes in terms of um, responses, recording what we've done and getting back to the customer. Right. So um, if they do want to be notified, that you, you've got to physically notify them they don't get something come through the app. They get an acknowledgement automated via the app, but we don't do updates within the app. We do updates within our own system. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, my Mandy. Thanks for that. So the next question that I've got here is, is it reasonable to assume that sealed roads will be maintained as sealed roads within the district and not be grounded, sorry, downgraded to unsealed pavements? Yeah, I mean, fundamentally, um, at the core of this question is the fact that uh, sealed road, even though it doesn't need as much attention along the way, is more costly over its lifetime than a gravel road, um, despite the gravel road needing a, a grader across it, you know, multiple times every year. Um, so that that's part of the challenge is sealed roads are more expensive. We've got 600 kilometres of them. It's fairly high for a fairly you know quite a rural area um we certainly had other districts have made decisions to return sealed roads back into gravel roads 
we haven't made that decision yet. It's not a question we've asked our community, um, but it's something that we we may get to the point where we have to do that um, if, it, if, if the overall cost of roading becomes too much. But uh, I don't think anyone who's got a gravel, uh, sorry, a sealed road in front of their place wants it to turn into a gravel one. But um, do you have anything to add on that one, Krishna? Yes, you do. <laughs> Go for it. Uh, the question was, is it reasonable to assume? I think it's pretty natural to assume. And at a network level, that would likely remain the case. But on a site-by-site -site basis, we are very seriously looking at um, not resealing some roads and allowing them to steadily, slowly degrade in terms of affordability. And that is one of the things that has been posed within the current options for the next 10-year plan. And then also when there are situations such as significant storm damage and it is incredibly cost prohibitive to reinstate a section of a road to sealed and it's much more affordable to maintain as a gravel surface, there have been some recently that have been left as gravel. And I think it's fairly reasonable to um, expect that will occur more in future. Yeah, we certainly have submissions on a regular basis for a number of gravel roads around the district that people do want to have sealed, and it, it is very hard to justify the the cost case on that. Um, Settlement Road in Kurao would be one of those uh, examples where uh, it's a reasonably well-travelled road, but it just doesn't stack up from a... a um, an overall cost analysis point of view, and unfortunately, yeah, definitely a few other roads in that in that boat as well. Tudor Hill Road is one that we thought we were going to get uh, sealed, but when the actual costs came back, it was just prohibitive to um, to get on with it. So, yeah, it's not easy. Um, when we get these these requests, we want to say yes, uh, we can do that, but unfortunately, we just they end up being very expensive to do, and that's that's the reality of it. Yeah, particularly where they are ones with not enough traffic, so we don't get the subsidy. We've got to basically come up with 100% of the cost. That is what makes it really expensive. Maybe. Thanks for that. So I've got another question that's come in. Is the Waitaki District likely to receive additional funding from the Central Government's Infrastructure Fund to pay towards long-term upgrades and short-term repairs? Any ideas on that one? The Infrastructure Fund. That's correct. Yeah, I'm not too sure exactly which fund it is. I was hoping no. you, you knew. Well, I've come across um, the Tourism Infrastructure Fund, which we've successfully ab um, applied for and, and obtained money from. I, th I think I, I think the new government has um, is talking about the major investment in infrastructure. They had, they do have um, a focus on infrastructure with the uh, I don't know if it's still being called the Provincial Growth Fund, but they. Um, it's one and a half billion dollars that they're putting into this with a focus on infrastructure. And um, I'm not too sure whether that applies to roading. They've in the past with those types of funds. Previous government at least would uh, normally take out roading projects and water projects from being um, fitting the criteria for it. But yeah, if, if there's a fund there that we can uh, link into, then we absolutely need to be looking at it because um, at a time where rates affordability is a really a critical level, we need to make sure that we're getting every other dollar that we possibly can get. Yeah. We we'll certainly keep an eye out and an ear out for any new funding opportunities and apply for them whenever possible. There was the SURF, which was the Climate Emergency Response, I think, fund or relief fund, no, recovery fund. I can't remember what the R was for. CERF. Yeah. which we'd applied for a, a bit from. In terms of uh, there's certainly been money put aside for the roads of national significance and the current drivers under the draft GPS are about enabling economic growth and uh, freeing up more land for housing in areas that are struggling with population booms. So we're unlikely to uh, qualify in that description, but Okay, well, we'll certainly keep an eye out for for the for those opportunities. Thank Thanks for that. So I've got a, a 
comment here rather than a question, but you might have something to say. But um, Hampton Township desperately needs a multi-use footpath from Liverpool Street, the fish and ship chip shop corner, down to the beach and up the other side, coming out opposite the second hand shop. Camping grounds really busy, plus the new motorhome association sites and seeing pedestrians walking on the road. The Western and Gown Road footpaths look fantastic, so something like that would be great. Safer communities together. Is that Lincoln, right, Lincoln Street? It's stated Liverpool Street down to the beach. Okay, yeah. There, there are challenges. All of those ones cross the railway line and it always be means a whole lot more hassle than we would like. Um, we I know we had looked, and I think it was Lincoln Street, um, getting a footpath down down that way. Um, the challenge, there was a number of challenges, the railway being one of them, but the, um, the, the reality is that the path, uh, sorry, the road actually goes down and it, and it cuts through um, the hip, some, some you know, raised areas and so forth. So um, it's it's actually quite a narrow channel that the road runs through, and to put a footpath next to that requires quite a major excavation into the um, the uh, the bank beside that, and uh, obviously retaining and so forth. That's required to to make sure it stays stable. So there's there's no easy answer to that. It is quite expensive. Um, at the Outgown Road was um, the the track along there was yeah it was it was Took a long time to get to that point. It seemed like a long time. Uh, a lot of discussions, a lot of community effort to help make that happen. And um, as Kushla mentioned before, we were lucky enough to get some subsidy in the end because we it wasn't looking like we would for quite some time. So um, yeah, the any anything you've got to add around that getting a footpath here? It's not that it can't be done. It's it's just it needs to be quite heavily engineered. Yeah, and it needs to fit into a board works plan for the local community board. So as Amir quite correctly pointed out earlier, that new construction is locally funded via the amenity rate and there's always a wish list of projects and a prioritisation of that. So a key thing is um, submissions into the annual plan to the community board um, and then those things can be investigated and researched in terms of likely use, um, available subsidy streams at the time. But, yeah, the key one there would be um, there's always going to be a lot of projects popping up in terms of, great, you know, the motor car have been sites there now, but did we know about it before? Would it have been sensible for us to start saving towards a project that we didn't know was going to be needed? So, and keeping rates affordable. Yeah, so this is because it is a new path, as I mentioned earlier, the um, new paths are funded from amenity rates. Um, we're um, in the Wahimo ward and the Hariri uh, wards, uh, we've got community boards and we rely on them to recommend things tr through to us, but equally we've got the ability to ask them when people make requests, um, you know, is this something they think is should be a priority for the expenditure out of that particular fund? So it, it is something where we can definitely look at it again, but I would suggest, um, you know, probably the, the best way would be do, do make a submission to the annual plan and do make that request. If you think there's an easier route than, than uh, the one you're suggesting or the one I'm, I've talked about, which was Lincoln Street, um, you know, let us know. Because if if it's a matter of someone going a, a block out of the way, but to get a safe um, safe journey from the main highway down to the beach, then we're, we're happy to look at that. Just to confirm, the person has confirmed that yes, they did intend to say Lincoln Street. So thank you. Right. Okay. Next one. So I've got a couple of questions here from uh, a couple of submitters, but they related to what we've been discussing earlier. So one person's just asked, is there going to be more checking to make sure that you are not, that I think to make sure that roads are not getting ripped up every six months, I'm assuming, it's a, um, in, in complete sentence. And then relating to what you are talking about earlier as well, not a question, but your examples given of high cost of traffic management and high cost of transporting machinery. Um, are both good reasons to repair roads properly. By properly, I mean more than just filling a single pothole if there are other potholes nearby. 
also regarding to SNAP in itself, and you may have answered this already, Kushla, um, do, does Waitaki District Council generally reply to people who have raised issues? Probably a question I would have is if, if our contractor is sent to fix a pothole and they see another couple of potholes nearby, should they be doing them? In terms of the patch repair, absolutely. If they've got enough material on the back and it's safe for them to do so. And um, sometimes what we see where, you go, oh, goodness, why was that one fixed and not that other one that's only 10 metres away? Uh, sometimes it's to do with contract boundaries. So whether it's uh, on the state highway or whether it's not, and that's about what they're allowed to do within their approved traffic management plan. And if we are working on a side road and then we come towards the state highway, even though it seems so logical, it's just there, but my boundary's here. And if I'm caught over there, then I can get in a lot of trouble and it's not worth it for my company for me to go and fix that there. So I'm just going to stay back here. Uh, but usually, yeah, if it's just that quick repair type thing as in the patching and it's just using cold mix that they've got on the back of the truck, if they have the material with them, then the expectation is that they would do that at the same time. If it's a full construction type repair, then no, we wouldn't want them going and doing a whole lot of others because if we haven't discussed it, we might go, well, actually, no, we don't want to do those digouts. We're going to do a stabby right across here and we don't want, because that's a more expensive repair method, but they won't solve this problem. So we only want you to dig out this bit and then we're going to use a different repair method there over there. So, Right. And in terms of the snaps in solve, um, do we get back to all customers? So there, some customers request specific uh, callbacks, in which case we definitely get back to them. Um, the Sometimes we don't get given the information and sometimes people select that they don't want to, to be um, contacted. So a lot of it depends on the, the type of thing that they've asked for um, and what contact details we have available. Thank you. That's great. Thanks for that. So we've got another question here. Is it correct that forestry organisations pay a levy over and above road registrations to compensate for road damage that their trucks cause? Yes and no. Um, what we do have is um, a separate uh, rate for uh, forestry um, forestry properties, basically. So um, it's, it's not your typical farming block, which, you know, might be 300 hectares and they might have 50 hectares of trees on it. Um, it's it's for properties that are predominantly have forestry on them. And the idea is that it basically accumulates funding in there and then it can be used um, to help upgrade roads in time for harvesting when that happens. Because, um, you know, the, probably the prime example that we've got in recent history was Horse Range Road down uh, between Morathi and uh, Palmerston, and a lot of forestry in that area. The forestry, uh, the harvesting started on that forestry, and the road was shot to bits in next to no time. And a lot of money, well over a million dollars, was spent on fixing that road. The the forestry company itself, I think, um, they provided around eighty thousand dollars, but the other the rest of the money had to come from ratepayers generally. So, we now have the fund um, which go it, it, it is rated on those particular properties, and it's um, uh, that helps collect a reserve which is ring fenced for fixing. Um, sorry, upgrading those roads before they need to be fixed uh, to actually make sure that they are going to stand it because with forestry you'll you'll have a rural road um might be gravel might be sealed uh it's been built for relatively light vehicles and um not many of them and when they start harvesting uh, very large vehicles many of them going backwards and forwards and uh that, that's the challenge on that so the road actually has to be built rebuilt essentially to to meet the um the the pressure that they're going to be on. That's my version of it. Do you have anything to add? I would have answered it very differently. Right. <laughs> would you like to hear my answer? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, we don't have a levy. Uh, it's not the user. It's, the as you said, the landowner that pays for the duration of the ownership. So uh, 
and it's a ring fenced fund so it's not part of the general maintenance so we we currently have a forestry roading rate which is four times the value of the standard roading rate and that money goes into a ring fenced separate pot of money um, in terms of maintaining the previous level of service for the public so and uh, we've started working on a, a proper policy for how that money can be spent because at the moment it's just a reserve fund and it's we've been collecting it for four years and we've got over eight hundred thousand dollars in the reserve fund now and so we're putting a draft policy in front of council in a few months time to say what uh, a proposal of how much the reserve fund should be kept at so that if there is a unforeseen event that something can be called upon without it needing to be um, drawn upon from general rates and working with the forestry companies about when they're harvesting, what the needs are and in terms of the use of the road, um, even without the four times higher rate, the, the landowners would have been paying typically for about 25 years without almost any use and then it's that the road gets that concentrated use. So it's about understanding when that concentrated use is and how we can prevent um, significant damage from occurring. Uh, and Stenhouse Road is a really good example where council and the forestry companies have worked together to address um, concerns raised by the public around there and what can be done to mitigate the potential negative effects of forestry activity. Mm. Yeah, it's not too different. Um, but yeah, I mean, it is important that it is, it's not the truck, trucking companies that pay and it's not a levy. It's a differential uh, on our rating system. Um, the reason we use the number we do is um, with a forestry company, uh, um, forestry property, the value of the land is pretty much what the capital value is. Roading's based on capital value. Now, normal farms um, might have a land value of, um, say, $4 million and a capital value, value of five or six. Um, with a forestry value, it, it'll be maybe that'd be $4 million, and that's pretty much the capital value because there's no improvements. The trees aren't seen as improvements that add to capital value. So um, this is a way to ensure that there is sufficient being paid to deal with that high damage that happens when forestry happens. Part of the policy that we're looking at is uh, the ways to work with those companies and actually do some preemptive work. So if we if we upgrade a particular road, which actually gets them to a um, to a highway far, you know, sooner and less travel on our roads, then that's a good thing because the highways are made generally with some noticeable exceptions along the way, are made for those heavier vehicles. So that's a good investment by us and for our ratepayers, and uh, it's good use of that um, forestry differential rate. Um, so, yeah, that's trying to find solutions to some of those problems and, um, you know, make, make it a wee bit more targeted at the exacerbator um, pays type, type arrangement. I think that's probably enough on that one, Mandy. Um, just was there anything in your long term plan for making gravel roads wider so that two trucks can pass safely where one doesn't have to go onto the grass verge? This is a question for you. Mm. Um, I'll probably just say that you know, as part of grading, you know, there is some work that does happen around when, when, um, uh, the roadside growth actually starts to narrow down the road and, you know, it's a bit of work to actually get um, gravel from those sides back onto the road and actually widen the road back to where it was. Um, I'm not sure if we're doing any of that work at the moment, but to take a, a narrow road that's always been a narrow road and making it wide, we, have we got any plans on that? I'm not not network wide. So there's certain areas where we're conscious that if there's uh, poor visibility, then they would be earmarked for a safety improvement. Um, but generally, if there's 
good visibility and the opportunity for people to slow and allow one vehicle to pass by pulling over slightly, that's the most affordable. Um, we could put together a, a extensive widening program, but um, there's there's no way we can afford that. Yeah, I think if people have you know a particular road that's a major issue, um, it is something we probably want to hear about or, or make sure that we are and we we know about so that we can plan that yeah. as opposed to just a general policy of having roads to a particular width. But um, yeah, the I, I guess the um, predominance of dairy industry you know, having dairy tankers move go down roads. Um, and you know the other heavy agricultural equipment and so on that's often associated with that does cause more issues and some roads are going to be affected quite a lot whereas others that have kept more traditional sheep and beef operation may not have been affected so much so yeah if if people have a particular concern do make a submission on those particular ones um can't promise that we're going to do anything about it, but it certainly makes sure that it's in our um, in our program to at least look at and see whether there's something can be considered. Yeah. Or even a snap sense of. Yes, snap sense of. Because sometimes it's only a case of there might be a, like a 20 metre section that could make a big difference to a lot of people, and that's something that we can do as opposed to going, let's look at making the whole road a minimum number of like six metres wide so that two yeah. vehicles to pass. Thank you. Thanks. We do have a number of questions still here, and I'm conscious of time. But um, one of the questions that was sent through earlier was any consideration given by W District Council or Ticket District Council to perform a performance and quality of works when the road maintenance contract was taken away from South Roads and handed to Whitestone? Yes. Um, part of the yes, procurement process, the tender process. Did look at um, does look at things like uh, experience, cap capacity, and the capability of a contractor. Um, I think there were there were changes to the actual contract from the contract that we had been using previously. Yeah, so the old contract six four two was different specifications. Is that what you mean in terms yeah, of changes yeah. to the contract? Yeah. So contract six four two ran its full length and its maximum allowable life. Um, South Roads were awarded the rollovers, so it wasn't taken off anyone. It ended. Before it ended, um, contract 870 was written and tendered. As part of the tender process, it was used the price quality method, which is a weighted attribute system, which puts actually, we put 60% of the decision making was based on attributes relating to quality. So that meant that not even the cheapest contract would win. And so I hope that answers that question that those things were assessed um, by a qualified tender evaluation team because it needs to be a very, very robust auditable process because we're talking about big dollars with big effects um, and taxpayers' money as well as ratepayers' money. Yeah, I think that's the thing. You know, people say, oh, they've just taken the cheapest price. Well, no, it's there's a lot more that goes into it than that. And and um, very often, yeah, it's not the cheapest price. We've just accepted a, a tender, but not for roading, but for another one that um, it was the it was the second cheapest, I think. But it was, um, you know, still a reasonable bit above the the lowest price. But we believe they'll do the better job, so that scored that particular company higher. So that's um, that's the way we do most of the tenders some some of the more basic ones are simply on price because basically the companies are selling the same thing but uh we're, we're using contracts like this the quality of the job is a really important part of it thanks for that so we just had a couple of comments that we've got through, through um forestry library levy please repair breaknet Break road is in a shameful state and then another comment is i'm sure every taxpayer wants their tax dollars spent on safe and effective roading uh, they just also made a comment that the Bridge on Teachmakers Road, just for the entrance, has disintegrated, and they'll make contact with Council tomorrow to register that um, matter. Um, then so another comment there, not sure if this falls under roading, but do you find it acceptable that it takes 24 hours after an accident has been reported and car debris is spread over the road before the debris is cleared up? 
So I, I can attempt to answer that one in terms of um, vehicle incident. We've got some information in terms of our response times within our current road maintenance contract, but sometimes it depends on the nature of the incident and the police investigation requirements because we're, certain things we're not allowed to touch for a certain period of time. So I'm not, I can't, can't give a definitive answer in terms of time frame, but um, there's some things that we're actually requ requested to leave in place. Um, and if it's a fatality, often the people who know um, someone who is uh, affected want to be able to go and even collect like bits of debris that, that were left after a vehicle. So we've got to be really careful um, how things are removed and how quickly. I, th I think if people see something, um, I mean, it does require an accident to be reported or at least the, the damage being reported to um, be cleaned up. So that, that is important if it's, you know, someone has a crash and managed to get the local farmer to tow them out or whatever it might be. Um, and, the, you know, the council doesn't know, the contractor doesn't know, then obviously that's a, a, a different issue. Um, but, yeah, if, if things are, you know, if it's 24 hours later and there's still stuff hasn't been cleaned up and um, particularly if the contractor has been there and you feel they haven't done a good job, then do let the council know and um, we'll get them back onto it. Thanks, Matt. We've got another question here. Um, if 20% goes towards roading and maintenance, et cetera, why has Palmerston not got proper footpaths? They've had gravel paths there and they're difficult for the kids and far now to run barefoot and ride a scooter or a skateboard. Um, they've been asking for proper concrete footpaths for years. Omaru's got pro proper footpaths and why don't Palmerston, when they pay the same amount of rates, so why don't they get the same treatment? Um. Okay, yeah, it, uh, basically communities pay f their amenity rates um, according to, um, you know, whatever is being pro projected uh, as far as work goes. So in the case of Palmerston, um, you know, it's, I mean, it's, it, it is only, um, you know, a, a fraction of the size of Omro. So like anywhere, I mean, well, I, I live in Western, um, we can't afford some of the things that Omaru can afford, but uh, we did have a program of getting on with footpaths. We, um, I was on the Western Progress League at the time and there was discussions with the council and there's been another program since then of more footpaths, but basically said we will use up the amenity rate that has been collected and we will want more footpaths put in place and the amenity rate will go into, into debt and we will pay that off over time. And that's what's happened uh, over two times now. And that's allowed a, a really good network of footpaths around Western. They're not, a lot of streets don't have footpaths on both sides. It's on, usually on one side. Um, and, you know, what had been um, done with a, a very fine chip seal, um, the latest lot of footpaths have been done as asphalt, which is um, better for scooters and things like that. So it can be done, but it is working with community board and council uh, and the community to actually decide what are the priorities. Are you are you prepared for your amenity rate to go into deficit and um, be, be paid off over a period of time? It might mean there's some other things that you don't get done, but it will maybe uh, help out with those sorts of things. So, yeah, it, there's always a challenge with small communities, uh, small populations. Um, fairly spread out area because it just means that you've got to do more footpath per property that they go past. But um, if if that is the desire of the community and the community board is um, agreeable, there's some, some, some things we can look at there. But it is uh, about each community funding its own footpaths um, to actually create the, the, the new ones. Once they're done, then the maintenance is looked after uh, across the, you know, by a district-wide rate. From roading. Happy with that? Well, the, the twenty percent referred to earlier um, in the consultation document is re referring to maintenance of existing, right. uh, as opposed to creation of new. So, creation of new footpaths is entirely the local rate. Um, Palmerston does not pay the same level of rates as other areas, and so if they want new 
or upgraded. Um, it costs way, way less to chip seal something than it does to asphalt or concrete. Concrete involves full excavation and reconstruction, and they're talking you know, well over $100 a square metre. Um, yeah, I think currently I would probably are closer to $250 a square metre to put in a new concrete footpath. So there's two new footpaths going into Palmerston this year, um, which are underway at the moment as part of the community board projects. And so in terms of expecting them to suddenly appear, that's not going to happen. Yeah, um, so I think there's different standards for footpaths. So generally it's either a gravel footpath, uh, chip seal, um, sometimes coarse, but usually a fine chip seal uh, or asphalt. And, um, you know, th three different standards of service, es essentially. Um, and if you're wanting kids to be able to scooter along them and, um, you know, prams with small wheels to go on them properly, then... Pretty much asphalt is the, the best option for that. Um, certainly more cost effective than, than concrete. So just clear on that one. So um, yeah, do, definitely um, take the time to make a submission on that. And that then it's discussed with the community board around uh, what their thoughts are on those particular streets that you might be talking about. Next. Thanks. Thanks. We've still got about um, 10 questions there. Are you willing okay, to... We better try and rattle them off really quickly. Okay, so just uh, why do South Roads do the maintenance of the airport and not Whitestone Roading that's council-owned? Um, don't know. Um, so it's a separate contract. It is a separate run contract. Run by a separate department, so it's it's being tendered out because there's quite different levels of service and expectations there. Yeah. Great, thanks for that. So why are the footpaths no longer being cleaned? There's smashed glass bottles in nearly every street. And further to that, why are metal footpath level things no longer being removed to clean under them so that the water flows? There's one on the corner of Thames and Stirling Streets, for example, that's had the same V can sticking out from under it for the last year. This is for Kayla. Uh, if you want to respond to that. Yeah, so the footpath cleaning, uh, we only rate for incomplete sweeping and cleaning of the CBD footpaths. So the other residential streets aren't cleaned um, and haven't been. We maintain vegetation and we fix trip hazards. And in terms of the metal grate thingies, uh, yes, they should be being lifted or the area being hand cleared and see it. We've noted the um presence of the V can and we're following that up. Yeah. Thank you. So I've got another so, question. Well probably just on that, you know, if you've got specific streets that you've got uh, particular concerns about, do let us know what those are um so that we've got something to go go on. And again SnapSend solves great for that because it date stamps the picture. So it helps us with the argument. Thanks so much. Another question we've got here. Do you find it acceptable for WDC's contractor to clear a drain by placing the dirt next to the road surface where it will later wash back into the drain or across the public road and into a local stream during the next rainfall? No. I was going to say that certainly sounds like a leading question where they, they want our answer to be no, but <laughs> I guess it depends on um, what they're cleaning and why and was it actually the council roading contractor or was it a helpful citizen um, just trying to reduce flooding. So in, in a major event, I would expect that would be acceptable actually because if that prevents massive um, or significant damage to um, prop a people, property um, or access, then that is acceptable. Yeah, yeah it, it, context is important, yeah. but um, on, on the surface of things, you know, if it was just a case of them doing routine maintenance and so on, then they either need to take it away or put it in somewhere where it's not going to wash back in there. But um, if you've got, again, if you've got a concern, do let us know, snaps in, solve it, or, um, or, or give us a phone call and let us know where it is. So back to the forestry, why are ratepayers paying for road maintenance when it's logging trucks making the damage? Should forestry or logging pay user levies rather than the ratepayers? So they already do, yeah, through so road user charges. <laughs> the, the trucks themselves pay, pay road user charges and that obviously is the, well, not obviously, but that is the funding that 
uh, Waka Katahi NZTA shares with councils. Um, so we get that contribution from those vehicle users, um, but it is the um, the properties that are being that the, the, those um, roads are serviced by that um, do pay rates if it's largely if it's a, a forestry property uh, as opposed to a farm with some forestry um, then they will pay four times the capital value of the um, the property and, and roading rates four times the rate roading rate for that property um, than what they normally would and that is put in a special fund that is spent on maintaining they the the roads um, and any roads that are affected by forestry harvesting. And it's not just forestry trucks, it's any heavy truck. So that's milk tankers, sheep trucks, goods and service trucks, anything that carts goods. And it's not just the truckies or the, the people who are employing the truckies that are benefiting from it. Like even if you're a person who only ever walks to the library and to the supermarket and to work, you're still buying goods that are transported on a truck. Um, so you're still an end user and you'll end up paying if we load it all onto the truckies that just gets passed on like affordability of um, you think about how much groceries have gone up in the last year and a half. A lot of that is to do with transport costs. So the answer isn't just to keep loading it up onto the transport operators. So there was a comment sent through earlier um, that it would be fairer if the rates assigned to roading were based on road usage rather than being based on a property's capital value. Yeah, look, rates are never a uh, totally fair tool that we've got, um, but they are pretty much the only thing we've got. So we, we've sharpened that tool as much as we can. Um, and, you know, the introduction of a roading differential for forestry was one of the most recent um, examples of identifying a need, identifying a you know a particular issue, and sheeting home the cost to that. Um, we don't have the power to create levies uh, on trucks or anything else. It is it is basically through rates and um, trying to make sure that's as fair as possible. Um, the you know the. Roading rate is based on the capital value of a property. So if you've got a, a million dollar house, you'll pay a particular amount. If you've got a $500,000 house, you'll pay half that amount. If you've got a $10 million farm, you'll pay 10 times that amount. So it is all directly proportional. There are a couple other differentials, which probably should mention. Um, one is for hydro generation. So uh, essentially that is Meridian. And they pay, um, they, they have a, a very high capital value. I don't know what it is now. It used to be around about 20% of the whole capital value of the district was Meridian and the stamps. It's probably slightly um, less than that. But they, rather than them paying, say, say it's 15% now, rather than them paying 15% of the roading rate, um, we give them um, a lesser amount. I think it might be 10% now. It used to be five and it was ratcheted up over time. Um, large scale mining is the other differential and that is essentially McRae's Oceana gold mine and they paid five percent of the rates and um, even their they, they, uh, situation was the other way around they their property ownership was around about half a percent of the district but they because of the damage to roads and so forth they paid five percent of the overall rate so th those are a couple of other examples where there's been a bit of um, manipulation of the pure model around capital value to try and make sure that actually, you know, some of the big uh, exacerbators did get to pay. And in case of Meridian, they didn't actually use the roads very much, so they paid less accordingly, but, uh, but more than they used to. So and Ministry of Transport have been consulting on that in the last year about looking at that as a national issue. How do our nation fund transport infrastructure? And those questions are being asked in terms of road user charges are the most fair way. It's very, very hard to work out what road usage is. And there was fuel tax, but then of course, people who use fuel for off-road uses um, 
power generators and on farm and that sort of thing were paying for road use when they weren't using roads. And then, of course, the fleet of electric vehicles weren't paying anything, but they were actually using roads and damaging roads too because they're extremely heavy and point loading. So it's a great question that the whole nation mm. faces. So, so, yeah, the Minister for Minister of Transport, uh, Simeon Brown, did make the um, you know, have a, just a discussion with us uh, the other week and said that they are looking at moving to road user charges for all vehicles, removing the excise tax off petrol and uh, going with RUCs, which will be a bit of a nuisance in some respects, but they they believe, you know, it, it is the heaviness uh, of the vehicles that do create the most um, damage to roads. The heavier they are, the more damage, and that's what they're looking to um essentially tax vehicles on through road user charges. Thanks. We've got a couple of final questions that were raised before um, the questions were closed off. So we got one regarding um, you you told us that you, we were going to you were going to resurface College Street in 2021, but no one turned up. And then further to that, someone's asked, is Western going to get their footpaths finished instead of gravel? Um, this they refer specifically to Essex Street being finished and Grove Street as well. Essex Street is a sealed footpath. Um, I know it well. I walk it often. Um, but it does have, uh, still has some loose chip on it. And um, it may just, I'll, I'll have a talk with Kushler about that. I've got a vested interest in it, uh, maybe a conflict of interest, but I'll I mean, mention it to her after this. Um, as yeah, what was the other one? Sorry, uh, the other one was just regarding uh, resurfacing College Street. Oh, College Street, yes. Um, yes, I do get regular reports. We'll see regular reports um, and on, on the, the roughness of that. Um, and uh, perhaps Kushler can comment on, you know, does it meet the test for actually being rebuilt or... Um, you know, what the challenges might be for that particular road. Any idea? Uh, I don't know the exact circumstances at the time when you were told that it would be done, um, but I do apologise for the confusion that that would have caused you if you're expecting someone to come. I know that our reseal list, um, we, we often have a, a three-year or a five-year rolling programme, and then those sites get changed in terms of priorities based on funding availability and then also what the tender prices come in and then we go, oh, my goodness, we need to chop out you know, seven kilometres of our resale list this year. And also looking at what the changing needs are within that time period. And so I know College Street is cosmetically unappealing and that it's got a two-coat sandwich seal on it that is 13 years old. It's holding up really well. At the moment, its greatest fault is that it doesn't get very much traffic and there's lichen growing on it. It looks ugly because of the service trenches, but the pre-reseal repairs have been done, and it's a very safe road. It just doesn't look very pretty. And, um, yeah, my priorities are not on cosmetics. So you say the pre-reseal -pre Work has been done or has been so done? In terms of failure, the slumping has been fixed. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And and so does that, when you say it's pre-reseal, does that mean the reseal is coming or is it just not scheduled at the moment? I no. don't. Okay. I don't know the answer to that question, but I know that any any major repairs that we would need to do ahead of resealing it have been complete in terms of it is now a safe, trafficable service, surface. There's just one last comment there that was just regarding Breakneck Road that they didn't receive an answer, but they hadn't actually asked a question. But if you've got anything to update on that one, question. Um, yes, I've got confirmation from one of my excellent team members that they'll inspect it this week. Get back. So, yeah. That's everything. Okay, so hopefully um, for those who have answered, uh, asked questions, we've um, given you some answers to those questions that uh, you can under, um, appreciate um, I know that not every answer we give is the answer that people are looking for so uh, if, if you've 
been able to be uh, satisfied with what we have been able to give you. That's great. Uh, again, this is part of the annual plan process. We really do ask that people make submissions if they are wanting things to be done, if they're wanting projects to be added, or, or even if it's just um, looking at a road like Breakneck Road. Um, if you think something needs attention, do bring it to our attention. We may be aware of it already, but it doesn't hurt to be reminded uh, if, if that's the case. Um, other than that, we've got um, got a list of actually of upcoming features. So this is the second uh, Q and A that we're we're doing. We've got another one. Um, uh, what is it? Next Tuesday night, uh, talking about what we deliver. Basically, the levels of service is the technical speak on that. So just um, the things that we deliver and to what level that we deliver those to. Um, the week after that. We're talking about rates affordability. Uh, I think we've got uh, Councillor Hopkins might be joining on that one, and um, he will have plenty to say on that one, um, as he's very good at saying that stuff. Uh, on the follow, sorry, following uh, week, we're talking about the annual plan summary and the submission feedback. So giving a bit of a, an update as, just to, as we get towards the last push for more submissions. Um, community meetings, we've had the Aotearoa one on Saturday morning, um, chose to do that for the long weekend with the hope that uh, we'd catch a lot of the holiday makers and so forth, but turned out to be the best day of the um, of the weekend, and uh, if, I think people would rather spend the time on the lake, but it was good to get the turnout that we did. Um, tomorrow, we've got two meetings in Omaru. One is at one o'clock at the Opera House, and the other one is seven o'clock at the uh, also at the Opera House. Thursday night is Palmerston, 7.30 at the Palmerston Sports Hall for that one. Uh, and then next Monday, Kura Memorial Hall for that session. Then Napara uh, on the Wednesday the 10th at the Rugby Club Rooms. That's 7 o'clock also. And Herbert, 7 o'clock on Sunday the 14th. That's not one that we've been... Uh, publicising, it's um, in response to some feedback we got from the community. So we've uh, thrown a, a, an extra meeting in there to cover some of the district that um, um, was probably just far enough away from our other meetings to make it worthwhile. So anyway, that's what's coming up. Uh, again, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Krishna, for all of your responses and to your team who've been feeding some of the, the info through. Uh, that's been very helpful to Mandy and the team that have helped put this on. Thank you very much. And uh, to you all, wish you all a very good night. Thanks for joining us and we'll catch you next time.